Hello again. Welcome back to the James C. Reviews. If you've been watching for the past few years, you would know that we've now entered my favorite time of the year. The Month of Horror. Although I'm not sure that'll mean much to anybody this year because 2020 has kind of been a horror show overall. Yes, it's time again. Just might die of but it's still the most magically terrifying time of the year for me. As I do every October, I'm going to start this round of JMC reviews by going way, way back, all the way to the Universal Monster Classics. Today we're looking at the original 1933 adaptation of H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man. Which I guess is kind of fitting because the last film I saw in theaters before the pandemic started was the 2020 Invisible Man. And for anyone wondering what I thought of that movie, I'll give you a quick summarization near the end of this review. Nice bedtime story for the kids too if they want it. Following up Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Mummy, and produced once again by Carl O'Mell Jr., The Invisible Man saw the return of Frankenstein director James Whale. Adapting the 1897 novel by H.G. Wells was R.C. Sheriff, who would later get an Oscar nomination for writing Goodbye, Mr. Chips, as well as some uncredited writing work from Philip Wiley, also the writer of Island of Lost Souls from 1932 with Charles Lawton, and Preston Sturges, who himself would later go on to win an Academy Award for writing The Great McGinney. Nice. Not thrilling, but nice. The Invisible Man, next to Dracula, is probably my second favorite of the original Universal Classic Monsters, mostly for the fact that he is, when you come down to it, the most dangerous and murderous of the original monsters. In this film alone, The Invisible Man kills over 120 people. He's insane, bent on ruling the world, but in a few specific moments, we see a small bit of his humanity still there. Similar to Lawrence Talbot in The Wolfman, The Invisible Man is also a bit of a tragic character. It's established that before he became invisible, he was apparently a semi-decent scientist who discovered a way to turn people invisible and, I guess lacking any test subjects, tested it on himself successfully turning himself invisible, but having no way at that point to make himself visible again. As he works and struggles to try and find a way to cure himself, his former associates discover that one of the drugs he used was a drug called monocaine, a drug that has the ability to drain the color from anything it touches, but also, if injected into a living being, will drive said person insane. It's revealed that while the information about it draining color is pretty well known in England, the information about it driving people insane is from a lesser known book that has since gone out of print, so he probably had no idea that it had this side effect. Are you an idiot? When the film starts, the Invisible Man has a bit of humanity still in him, struggling to try and find a way to cure himself and even showing a little bit of vulnerability. But the more people get in his way, suspecting him of being up to no good, the more violent he gets, and soon enough he starts proclaiming that he's hell-bent on ruling the world. It came to me suddenly. The drugs I took seemed to light up my brain. Tell me, you know, what is it that makes it so wonderful? And the guy said, well, it intensifies your personality. And I said, yes, but what if you're an asshole? <laughs> All the while, his former associates and fiancé try to find a way to help him, and the police, searching the whole country, trying to figure out how they're going to capture a man they can't see. The premise of The Invisible Man is a really good storyline for a horror movie. He's not a supernatural monster, but he can cause just as much damage and even more. We see The Invisible Man throughout the film attacking random people on the streets, destroying things, and in one particular awesome sequence, he switches the tracks on a railroad, causing a train that, according to the police, was carrying over a hundred people to crash into a river. and. 
and apparently they all fucking died. And just like The Mummy, The Invisible Man was a pre-code film, which meant they could get away with a little bit more before the censor cunts really started paying attention. And you can see that through some of the more violent kills throughout the film, particularly a scene where The Invisible Man bashes in the head of a policeman. Not particularly graphic by today's standards, but it's still a pretty brutal kill. There's also one particular line that I was surprised to hear in a film from the early 1930s. An invisible man can rule the world. He can rob, rape, and kill. <laughs> this is the first time I'd ever seen a film from that time period mention the subject of rape. Which, even though it was a pre-code film, they didn't go that far. But that's another scary scenario it presents with the idea of an invisible man. And some later invisibility films would explore that idea, like Hollow Man. Made on a, according to what I read, budget of $328,033, Invisible Man was the most successful horror film for Universal Pictures since James Whale's Frankenstein. And I can see why the Invisible Man was groundbreaking for its time, not just in horror, but in special effects. And while they do look a little fuzzy in some areas, these effects in certain parts really hold up pretty well. For the time it came out, this movie must have been mind-blowing. The effects for The Invisible Man were a mixture of wires, but whenever The Invisible Man wears clothes, they'd have the lead actor or whoever was doubling for him wear a black velvet suit against a black velvet background. 1930s blue screen, pretty much. And while it does cause a few issues in certain areas, for what they had to work with at the time, this is still groundbreaking. The most impressive special effects scene, which they highlight in this Invisible Man documentary I saw many years ago, is when he's unbandaging himself in front of a mirror. According to the documentary, they had to shoot this scene four times, and what they did was, they filmed him unwrapping himself from behind, filmed the room he was in, filmed the room inside the mirror, and then filmed him again from the front unwrapping. Holy shit, that is devotion. The special effects were done by John P. Fulton, and if the Oscar for Best Special Effects was around at the time, you bet your ass he would have won. He would later get Oscar nominations for his work on the sequels, The Invisible Man Returns, The Invisible Woman, and Invisible Agent, as well as winning two Oscars for his effects work on Wonder Man and The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. The music by Heinz Romeld, who was uncredited and also did music for Dracula's Daughter, doesn't appear a lot. This was after Dracula and Frankenstein were pretty much musicless, but it does appear in the beginning and for the climax they put the music to decent use. The biggest crew member who deserves credit is cinematographer Arthur Edison, who himself won three Oscars for his cinematography on In Old Arizona from 1929, All Quiet on the Western Front from 1930, and Casablanca from 1942, a film that would feature the invisible man himself, Claude Rains. Speaking of which, Claude Rains, who would later play a big supporting role in 1941's The Wolfman, gives an incredible breakout performance as Dr. Jack Griffin, balancing out insanity, vulnerability, and a nice little comedic side. In the beginning when he has to act vulnerable and stressed, you do feel sympathy for him, but when he has to go full-blown insane, he is legitimately threatening. Which is very impressive considering his whole performance has to rely pretty much entirely on his voice. We do get a few scenes of him dressed up wearing the trademark bandages, but for the most part, it's just his voice. What was that screaming? I killed a stupid little policeman. Smashed his head in. At the time, Claude Rains' only film credit had been a 1920 silent film called Build Thy House, and Universal Pictures, wanting to write off the success of Frankenstein, wanted Boris Karloff and, I read at one point, Colin Clive to play Jack Griffin. Karloff wasn't interested because he wouldn't be seen, and Clive, he was just too tired and wanted a vacation. 
James Whale, he always wanted Claude Rains. He's got a very smooth, relaxing voice that can be just as elegant as it is threatening. We'll begin with the reign of terror. Just these fingers around a signalman's throat. In the supporting cast, we get Henry Travers as Dr. Cranley, Griffin's former mentor, showing that Clarence had a very interesting life before he became an angel in training. Gloria Stewart, who many would know as the older version of Rose from James Cameron's Titanic, plays Flora Cranley, Dr. Cranley's daughter and Griffin's fiance, who is just a crying mess about Jack leaving and obsessively wants to know where he is. I've never seen him like it before. He was always so keen to tell me about his experiments. Gloria Stewart, she was great in Titanic, but good fucking God. She gives the most annoying fingers on a chalkboard performance in this entire film. It alters you, changes you. Oh, come and stay with us. Let's fight this thing out together. Although, I get why they include the character. Aside from having the generic 1930s romantic subplot, her scene with Griffin shows that there was a little bit of humanity left in him, and before the serum took him over completely, there might have been a more decent side to him. But other than that, the Cranley father and daughter characters really aren't that memorable. The biggest supporting character is Dr. Arthur Kemp, played by William Harrigan, a fellow assistant to Dr. Cranley, who Griffin goes to after being outed by the town folk as being invisible, and under threat of death, forces Kemp to help him, all the while proclaiming that they will be partners, acting and talking with a very superior attitude. We'll soon put the world right now, Kemp. You and I. We get a scene earlier where Kemp tries to persuade Flora to forget Griffin and proclaim his love for her, which goes nowhere and just leads to more unbearable crying from Gloria Stewart. It's a pretty much a rehash of a similar subplot from James Whale's Frankenstein. Griffin calls Kemp a coward, which he is, but on the other hand, if you were in his situation, I think you'd pretty much be the same. Even though he definitely has certain weaselly qualities to him, I felt a little sympathetic when Griffin eventually killed him for ratting him out to the police. Goodbye. <laughs> Looks like car explosions were always big in Hollywood. Another part of the Invisible Man that really sets it apart from the other classic Universal monsters is, next to being a horror and sci-fi movie, it's also part comedy. The Invisible Man is insane, so we get some admittedly over the top, but pretty fitting moments for him where he cackles like a lunatic. <laughs> It's said that the Invisible Man's crazed persona would serve as an inspiration for Mark Hamill's interpretation of the Joker, and I can totally see it. <laughs> we get some pretty enjoyable slapstick moments, such as the Invisible Man stealing a bicycle, knocking over a baby, yeah I know, terrible, but it's still a little funny, stealing money from a bank and throwing it out to the townspeople, who in typical fashion forget about the fact that he's an invisible killer and just jump for the money, all the while he sings Money goes, up goes the weasel! Money, 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 money! As well as a part where he picks up a policeman and, showing that he's really fucking strong, swings him around like a ball on a string. The scene where the police finally capture the Invisible Man is very well done. The music, while limited, fits here perfectly. They discover the Invisible Man hiding in a barn as it snows. The police surround the barn, set fire, and drive him out. Leading to an impressive effect where we see his footprints appear in the ground. The only downside is the effects team fucked up and made shoe prints instead of footprints. What does incompetent mean? But nonetheless, while running from the fire, he gets shot. The doctors can't heal him due to the invisibility, so with only a few moments left to live, they bring Flora in. Griffin, apparently regaining his senses at the very end, says he's sorry. 
I meddle in things that man must leave alone. And then, after over 70 minutes of just hearing his voice and seeing him in an interesting series of get-ups, we finally see what he looks like. And it's an emotional moment seeing him both come back but also die. In the 1950s, Claude Rains took his daughter to a re-release of The Invisible Man. It was cold, and he was wearing a hat and scarf that covered his face. He went up to the ticket booth, and when asking for two seats, the ticket taker recognized him right away just by his voice and offered to let them in for free. Rains' daughter claims he was annoyed and insisted that he pay. And when they went in, Rains' daughter said that he talked throughout the film, just giving his own live commentary to her as they watched it, and the other patrons, realizing that Reigns himself was in the theater, stopped watching and just listened in, and I gotta say, that sounds like a fucking awesome experience. What a great story. Mm. Other supporting actors I just want to give a quick shout out to include E.E. E. Clive as Constable Jaffers, a very funny policeman who has some pretty memorable moments with the Invisible Man. Put the handcuffs on. I can I handcuff a blooming shirt. And Uno Connor as Jenny Hall, one of the owners of the inn that the Invisible Man stays at the beginning of the film. And when his reign of terror starts, she just turns into a screeching mess. And while it does get pretty fucking annoying after a while, the Jenny character does have some pretty well done scenes, including the first special effects scene of the movie, and James Whale kept using her because he found her acting hysterical, and he would later use her in Bride of Frankenstein, where she pretty much played the same character. Turn it off! The Invisible Man is a very well done, eerie, and also pretty funny sci-fi horror film. Of all the original Universal Monster Classic films, I have a feeling this one would intrigue modern audiences the most, with its plot and probably because of the recently put out 2020 remake. Speaking of which, for those wondering what my thoughts on the 2020 remake are, I did a fresh from the theater vlog review, and if you want to get my full thoughts, go check that video out. But to sum it up quickly, I don't consider it a great modern horror film like many reviewers and critics of the past year have said. I went into it with an open mind, and my main issues being, for a movie called The Invisible Man, the Invisible Man really isn't in it very much. I don't mean just because you can't see him, I mean he's not the main character. The Invisible Man is, as far as his action goes, the chaos he wrecks, he's only in maybe 10-15% of the film. And the plot has virtually nothing to do with the original story. I mean, the 1933 film took liberties with H.G. Wells' novel, but it was still a adaptation. The remake? He's a scientist who turns himself invisible, and his name's Griffin. Other than that, nothing. The movie's about a woman breaking away from her abusive boyfriend, who is the invisible man of the title, and after faking his death, uses not a serum that drives him insane, but a suit that he built that can turn him invisible to stalk and terrorize her and drive her back to him. So yeah, he's already crazy, and as a film that's about a abuse victim getting away from her abuser, I think it was pretty decent in certain areas. But as an Invisible Man movie, I thought it just failed. It feels like it was written as a domestic abuse film first, and then at the last minute they just tacked on the invisibility plotline. I mean, the asshole makes himself invisible and uses it to just try to drive his ex-girlfriend back to him. In the original movie, over the course of a single day, the Invisible Man killed over a hundred people. I know a lot of people really like the remake, but as far as Invisible Men movie go, I think I'll stick with the more catastrophic version.
The remake, well, I do think it has some really well done moments and Elizabeth Moss gives a pretty good performance. I just don't see it going down as one of the greatest horror classics of all time. While the original, which broke ground in what could be technologically achieved, will continue to live on as one of the most impressive films in both horror and cinema for a very long time. Which is not surprising, it's probably a reason it was selected for the National Library of Congress in 2000. Eight. At last, the great wonderful day. I hope you enjoyed the first James C. review of October. Next week, we'll be looking at a, another horror comedy. This one more on the cult classic side and from the 1990s. And I'll be having a very special friend return to co-host.